number, you know, press one to do this, press two to do this, or press three to vote for what, for, you know, press three if you think, um, you know, somebody should run for president again, and have that essentially write to the internet right away. So this isn't the extreme, this isn't the everyday case, but the, the point, one of the points I raised in the book is, shall we count that as an internet experience? And if you want to say no, then you have to have a very good idea of why exactly you would say no, where you draw those kind of boundaries. You can even go one step further with that and argue that, well, maybe I'm not using the internet, but my, but my friend who's sitting right next to me is, and she's querying health information, she's telling me what it is based on questions I'm asking, am I an internet user if I never touch it directly? And when you do all this together, you go back to that Facebook map that had the footprint, and you get to a situation where you could make an argument that up to 85% of the world has some kind of access to the internet. Anybody who lives near enough to somebody who has a phone that can make a phone call to an IVR server can conceivably be on the internet. That doesn't mean that we have six billion internet users, but it does mean that those kind of cut and dry numbers of there are, you know, there are only as many internet users as there are smartphones, for example, um, isn't necessarily the case. So I raise this all just to get our definitions going. The other thing I want to say with the slide is what is certainly the case is there's more heterogeneity of, of internet experiences than perhaps we were expecting to see five or 10 years ago, 10 years ago, when everybody was kind of using the internet while sitting at a computer, peering through a browser, getting to a web page. You know, the internet has got a lot more kind of permutations to it now. Um, so what happened to me is I gave up on being able to give you a definition. And I, I, I come clean in the, in the in the book about it, that there's no single cut and dry definition. And this, what I ended up with was something where I, I kind of talked about uh, a, a pole and an antipod, <coughs> antipod, right? A pod and an antipod, right? The traditional kind of fixed thing, which, which in its, in, you know, where it was sort of an assemblage of the more of these things that were true if you were doing production, if you were in a place, if you had a high fixed cost to get into it to begin with, if once you were on, you were really on, you had an unlimited connection. Uh, you were plugged in somewhere, you weren't necessarily wireless, you were able to multitask. That's kind of the old archetype of fixed computing. And that mobile had kind of, the more of these things that were true, the more likely it is that the thing that you were describing was, an, was a mobile internet experience. Um, and so I came up with these kind of things all existing elsewhere in the literature, things like it's so cheap to buy a phone. People buy a phone because they want a phone and then they find they've got an internet connection anyway. That's great. Like the incremental cost of getting online is zero plus whatever data you spend. Um, personal, portable, internet, Mimi Ito stuff, um, universal, kind of more task supportive, app, appy, you know, not multitasking, uh, certainly wireless, and use of space pricing, which again, South Africa uh, has kind of come to uh, understand better than most, right? The, the, the caps and the pay by minute and all that. So, the, the book kind of hooks on taking these same things, each of which helps explain why people want, people want phones and why the mobile internet has spread so quickly, uh, and, and kind of playing with these as the elements which create those new opportunities and constraints and the things that we should be thinking about. They have implications, both good and bad, for how we think about ICTD practice, uh, which is what the second and third part. Um, does anyone want to stop and ask a question or two on that before? I know you want me to take questions at the end. There's something urgent I'm happy to take it before we go to the next part of the talk. Okay. So, with that kind of admittedly fuzzy framework, which is there's this new uh, antipode to fixed computing, which is mobile internet experiences, what do we make of that specifically for? the things that I think a lot of us care about, which are outcomes like development and inclusion, digital inclusion, social inclusion. Um, the first is, let's talk about the, I guess the good news, the new superpowers. Um, this is a quote I'm gonna read from a mobile media scholar, he's not an ICTV guy, he talks mostly about uh, things happening in the US, but his name is Jason Farmer. Uh, and he says, in the, in the emerging information landscapes that are experienced through mobile media, the site specificity of data and the simultaneous removal of geographic fixity demonstrate two key features of our interactions with these technologies. 
And as I was kind of working through, I'm going to flip back here for a second. As I was working through what all of these things meant, I had to go to the mobile guys, to the mobile literature, to find a, a good kind of articulation of that. And there are some others, but I like Jason's uh, articulation of the paradox there, that you, can, you get both at the same time, and that's the thing that's kind of different than an old fixed experience, right? Is you can either use that phone, at, you're sitting at the dinner table, you know, dad's talking, your head's down, bam, and you are anywhere in the world you want to be, and your dinner table no longer matters, your place no longer matters. Um, that, was the, that was the case for mobile phones, making telephone calls, but now it's the case for all data. The fact that you can get any information in the world, you can have almost any media experience you ever wanted from anywhere is a new thing. But then conversely, some of those media experiences you want, some of those information experiences you want, are specifically about the dining room table you're sitting at, or the house you're in, or the street corner you're on, and all that. And there's some other kind of thing you can do with letting the phone actually bring you closer and in more kind of more layers of context and meaning around the place you're in than ever before. And so just keeping that paradox or keeping both of those new you know, superpowers in place is, is kind of nice and, and I think we could work through some of those implications for ICTD. So there's a chapter in the book that, that does this and I, all I can do is give you kind of headlines right now to get a sense of the, those kind of informational paradoxes the, the fact you can do it both ways. If you're doing the place less stuff, you know, the things that, that make, that reduce the friction of the place you're in, it's got huge implications for diasporas and refugees. We saw that with the, there's been stuff in the media lately about the Syrians and their phones and all that. And you can really see people leveraging placelessness in, in new ways. Um, better markets and, you know, uh, everybody being able to kind of sell to people in a, in a broader place. And this is the essence of, of, of e-commerce, right, is now m-commerce, it's even more charged. Mobile money isn't really always internet-based, you can do it with USSD or whatever, but it's kind of shifting that way, and so there's, there's things you can do again by, you don't need to go to a bank, you can do your banking where you are, that's great. Um, and, uh, and learning straightforward, this one I think is the most complex one. The, I had the hardest problem writing that one of the rest of them, but I wanted to raise it, and I thought that there was a, a way in which kind of place and agency and personality and being able to kind of control, you know, when you were interacting with whom was a good place to kind of start that. And I've made some reflections and I, and I cite some literature of people kind of looking at kind of the micro geographies of the household and how they have phones and now data enabled, phone-based phone data connections um, kind of re allow a renegotiation of power in the, in the household. It's not all going to be great right away, but uh, there's definitely some problems we still have. And then the converse, there's the font problem manifest, sorry, um, is um, with kind of what can you do with the placeful stuff. And that's geographic information systems and better agriculture, great stuff on protest and pressure. And, you know, we, we, we haven't necessarily gotten it entirely right yet, but, you know, to hear Square and Eric Spring and all these sorts of things have mobile data components to them that are worth unpacking and understanding. Um, and again, if not for development in a kind of narrow sense, but for inclusion and participation in a broader sense, have, have pretty big implications. Um, and finally, there's one in economics, which I've you know, place without value change, which I'll, I'll talk about later. I'd rather not go into, as much as I want, if I had more time with you, I'd take it. Um, instead of going into details on this, I just want to sort of signal that these chapters kind of play with that paradox a little bit. And that's like all the good news and all the kind of stuff that I think there's lots of opportunities for ICTD practitioners and, and people who are building new code and all to kind of leverage these new superpowers or give people the ability to leverage their superpowers in, in new ways. That's the good news. Can I do a little bit on bad news? Well, I've got a few minutes left. Bad news. New constraints. Uh, which is the internet that we got is not the internet we expected to get. And it's not the internet we were writing about for 20 years. We have an internet with new properties and if you only have an internet connection that's mobile, and is pay by the go, and is only that big, and is brought to you by three companies, uh, your internet is not the same internet that we expected you would have. And so even the declarations of victory, because everybody's got a phone, are maybe shallow victories. So the bad news is there are some new constraints which are critical issues which need to be kept at the forefront of design and of policy and of uh, business models to see if we can get around it and keep doing the work towards getting people actually 
uh, to a place where they don't just have access, but they can use things effectively. And so, you know, there are a lot of different ways into this kind of argument. I like Michael Gernstein from Community Informatics. There's a nice piece on effective use, which I try to marry to the affordances perspective from HCI and talk about whether the affordances of the mobile phone, uh, mobile data phone, give you the ability to kind of use the internet as effectively as we want. <coughs> Caveat being, I think, for the most part they do, and it's only at the edges where it doesn't, but those edges are where we should work. There's three <coughs> big buckets of constraints. First is the metered mindset, which is, you know, the, the, all we need to see is that the term surfing, internet surfing, is still around. Browsing is almost as bad to know that something's wrong, because everybody who's paying by the bit, who's on a meter plan, or has a monthly cap, or a daily cap, or a, or a half an hour a day cap, or whatever it is, doesn't browse and doesn't surf, doesn't load everything up to the cloud, doesn't use Google Maps, doesn't download their software updates. It's a whole bunch of ways in which their internet experience is not as effective as the one that we, some of us, are lucky enough to have because we've got an unlimited connection. It's the instinct of why Facebook wants to zero rate and, and subsidize a bunch of internet time. Twitter wants to do that. Google wants to do that. Is this instinct that there's a problem there. We have to be very careful about how we solve the problem in a way that's uh, appropriate and preserves the internet. The second, and this is a, was a hard thing to write, is a, a sort of, there are still things that are easier to do with a PC. Um, there are fewer of those things all the time because the phones are getting better every day. And typing a short message is actually easier on a phone than it is on a PC now. Writing a book is still easier on a PC. Um, cutting a Vine movie is easier on a, P, on a phone than it is on a PC. Making uh, an animated feature that's going to make you you know, $100 million, you're not doing that on a phone. Um, and so there is this little class of things that are, sadly, the, in a way, the most high value production things, either for earning a living or for getting your voice heard, that to some extent are still kind of clustered around production activities that are built around a, phone, uh, built around a PC. And so the question is, can we be much more careful about asserting that everybody's on the same playing field and everybody's got an equal voice in this public sphere, along this digital public sphere, if some have PCs and a lot of people don't. And I'm not advocating that everybody needs a PC. I am probably advocating that everybody still needs access to a public um, you know, community access center where they can get a PC when they need one for the two or three times in, in a year that they, they really need one. They need to be able to have it. We're not done with PCs. And the third thing I'd say, uh, this is my, um, this is my wall garden. The bar. What do you do? <laughs> so this is an old um, this is an old quote from Jonathan Zittrain. And this is a whole chapter I try to build around the the shift away from an internet in a Tim Berners Lee kind of vision, when everybody had the equal opportunity to read and write to servers and the equal opportunity to contribute to the net as to take from it. And Zittrain in in um, 2008 sort of raised some alarms that the, that the trajectory of the of phones and app stores and such wasn't going to give us that same capability. I, I don't think it's quite as dire as it was uh, because app stores, for example, give you, you know, a million different desires. You can kind of, you can customize your phone and do an awful lot. But it's still hard, not possible, but it's hard to write an app on a phone, for example. Um, you know, I, you, can't, you can't check in a phone, you can't check in an iOS app that's been written on iOS. You can do it on Android. Your, your probably app won't look great, but you, you can do it on Android. But there's still ways in which, again, there's some production problems, and there are ways in which you get set up to be not quite on the same level uh, if you're a phone-only person. So what's the resolution as I'm getting to the end of this talk? Um, one is, there's a big difference, I think, still between um, talking about, sorry, the repertoire is kind of thing. Um, between declaring victory because every because people all have phones to declaring victory because people are mobile centric. I, I think there's a big difference between mobile only and mobile centric. And I'm never gonna argue that we're gonna be anything but mobile centric for a long time. The phones are at the heart of our digital lives. But we need to kind of keep an eye on all the other resources. Some of those are devices you can see. Some of those are the networks that you have affordances to the, the, the ability to get. So not just having a, a, a SIM card, but having a broadband connection somewhere, I think remains incredibly important. 
And I think also having access to services and the servers that are kind of parsing your identities for you uh, in ways that, 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 um, that, that don't 